In this video, I'm going to cover valence shell electron pair repulsion theory and also how that applies to the polarity of molecules. When we're drawing Lewis structures and we're putting electrons around atoms, um, it's important to realize that those electrons are negatively charged and so they repel each other. And so they'll be most stable when they are as far apart as possible because electrons all being negative, all being kind of in the same spot around the same atom, uh, they need to spread out because they repel each other. So they try to spread out as far as possible on the atom. So uh, the resulting geometric arrangement will allow us to predict the shape, the shapes and bond angles in the molecule. So this is kind of the idea. When we put an electron pair around a central atom, so this molecule here has three bonds, for example, when we put these electrons around the atom, they want to spread out from each other because um, although the ones that are um, in a pair, they are not, re they're not repulsed, uh, repelled by each other because of the way that um, one, uh, the way that they're spin paired, one is spin up and one is spin down and they're in the same orbital. So because of the way that they share an orbital, they don't repel each other quite as much. But this pair of electrons does repel this pair of electrons and it does repel this pair of electrons. So the pairs are very, um, there are strong repulsions between the pairs of electrons. So what that means is that they can't all be right next to each other. I can't move this pair of electrons any closer to this one because they're kind of pushing, they're pushing it apart on each other. So that yield, when we, um, depending on how many electron groups there are around the atom, that's going to put the electrons in different, with different angles around that central atom. So that will yield different shapes. Each lone pair of electrons constitutes one electron group on a central atom. So we're going to um, have to come up with some way to, to uh, count what we call electron groups. And um, when we have a pair, a lone pair of electrons, that counts as one group. And a bond also counts as one group. And here's the thing that's a little bit tricky. It doesn't matter if it's a double bond or a triple bond or a single bond. It only counts once. So if we are counting the electron groups, let's look at this molecule down here. Here is an atom. How many electron groups are around this atom? Well, this lone pair counts as one. This lone pair counts as another one, so that's two. And here's a bond. That bond counts as another one, so that's three. It doesn't matter that it's a double bond. It only counts once. One, two, three. Now if we look at nitrogen, how many does nitrogen have? A lone pair counts as one group. This bond counts as one group, so that's two. And this bond counts as one group, so that's three. One, two, three electron groups around nitrogen. Now let's look at oxygen. How many electron groups does it have? One, two, three, and a bond, four. So this oxygen has one, two, three electron groups. Nitrogen has one, two, three electron groups. And oxygen has one, two, three, four electron groups. When a molecule, <coughs> excuse me, when a molecule has two electron groups, then those electron groups spread out as far as possible on the, um, from as far as possible while still being attached to the central atom. And what that, uh, the geometry that that gives us is called a linear geometry. So the electrons, these electrons right here, try to get as far away from these electrons as they can, and they're on the opposite side. So that means that one bond is gonna point this way these electrons will be on this side of beryllium and the other bond is going to point this way because these, these electrons here in this bond and these electrons here in this bond, they're repelling each other. So when they repel each other, this bond is going to try to be as large as possible and that gives us 180 degrees when we have two electron groups. So again, here we see, oops, here we see another example of how it doesn't matter if it's a single bond, single bond electrons, 
single bond electrons, one group, two groups, or double bond electrons, double bond electrons, one group, two groups. If there's two groups, they're 180 degrees apart. Doesn't matter if they're single or double. Here's another one with a, a, a single bond and a triple bond. This is also 180 degrees because the triple bond only counts once. So that's one, uh, one electron group, two electron groups. If there's two electron groups, then the bond angle is 180 degrees. Uh, the linear geometry, when we're thinking about um, the uh, the orbitals that are involved in these um, uh, bonding pairs of electrons. So remember that the electrons around an atom are in orbitals, and we call those orbitals s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals. When the electrons are in a bond between two atoms like this, then the uh, orbitals change shape. So this is kind of a representation of what the orbitals look like when uh, when I have a linear geometry and I have two groups of electrons. So remember that a p, it's kind of looks like a p orbital, right? Remember that a p orbital kind of has two lobes like this, and it's kind of uh, the nucleus goes in the middle. So that's kind of similar to um, what this um, sp orbital looks like. It has one lobe that goes over here and makes this bond and one lobe that goes over here and makes this bond. When there are three electron groups around a central atom, this is called trigonal planar geometry. So two groups is linear geometry, three groups is trigonal planar geometry. So um, three electron groups, this is an example. So one thing I should point out, let me go back here. This is um, this is an exception to the octet rule, right? Two, how many electrons are around beryllium? Two, four. Beryllium only has four electrons around it. But where, because of where beryllium is in the periodic table, it's only in the second column, um, it can only hold that many electrons. And it's stable, it's neutral when it has that many electrons. So beryllium here uh, is an exception to the octet rule with four electrons. And here's boron with two, four, six electrons. So boron is an exception to the octet rule too. When I have two single bonds like that with beryllium, it's linear geometry. When I have three single bonds like this uh, with boron trifluoride, this is called trigonal planar. So the two bonds get as far away as possible, which is 180 degrees. But when I have three bonds, as far away as possible is 120 degrees. If this group right here tries to get any further away from this one and make that angle bigger than 120, then it's actually making this angle right here smaller than 120. So I have 120, 120, 120. That's as far apart as the, these three groups can get. When I have a, a molecule with trigonal planar geometry, the um, orbitals similarly um, kind of look again like half of a p orbital except now they have the same geometry as the molecule down here because it's the orbitals themselves that are that yield this geometry that uh, give us 120 degree bond angles so here's what it looks like when those three electron groups try to get as far away as possible one electron group is over here, one electron group is over here, and one electron group is over here, and the nucleus of that atom is right here in the middle. When there are four electron groups around a central atom, that's called tetrahedral geometry. Now, there's going to be a table at the end where we put all of these together, so um, uh, the, there's a lot of new words here, a lot of nomenclature to remember all of the different names of the shapes. So we had linear, trigonal, planar, and now this one's called tetrahedral. The reason it's called tetrahedral is tetra means four, and if I draw a line between all of these H atoms right here, the shape that I make is it kind of looks like a pyramid. It's called a tetrahedron. 
um, <clears throat> the angles between bonds in a tetrahedral geometry when there are four electron groups these angles are 109.5 so two, ang two electron groups gives us angles of 180 three electron groups gives us angles of 120 and four electron groups gives us angles of 109.5 that's as far apart as these bonds can get this angle is 109.5 this angle is 109.5 this one's 109.5 this one's 109.5 and so on all of these groups are 109.5 degrees apart from each other there's the tetrahedron when there are five electron groups and again I should mention that when there are five electron groups that means that this molecule is an exception to the octet rule because five electron groups means that I must have ten electrons around that central atom and when there are ten electrons or five groups then this um, geometry is called trigonal bipyramidal so trigonal means three tri is the beginning tri like a triangle tri means three and that's referring to these three right here so trigonal just like the trigonal planar when I have three groups it, it actually is the same shape as this because these groups right here are 120 degrees apart so the trigonal part of a trigonal bipyramidal geometry is the same as the trigonal part of trigonal planar so it's where it is different is that it now has a group on top of that th three membered shape and a group below and so the angle between the groups above and below and those that are in the um, equator here that's a 90 degree angle so 90 degrees here 90 degrees here and 120 degrees between all of these here in the middle so this is called trigonal bipyramidal because if we were to draw the lines between all of these chlorine atoms here we would make a shape that looks like it has two pyramids so bipyramidal means two pyramids if there are six electron groups around a central atom another exception to the octet rule two four six eight ten 12 electrons around sulfur here if there are six electron groups one two three four five six then the geometry the, these electrons try to spread out as far as possible and this is the geometry that that gives us we have two groups one pointing straight down one pointing straight up these are 180 degrees apart and then um, instead of having three groups in the middle like trigonal bipyramidal now we have four groups in the middle uh, so these four groups are all 90 degrees apart from each other these are 180 degrees across the central atom so this looks a bit like the Cartesian coordinate system the X Y and Z axes so here's the octahedron if we connect all of the, the corners of all of those atoms and here's all the electron groups when you cram one, two, three, four, five, six electron groups all together, it's like tying six balloons together. It kind of takes the same shape. Those balloons can, can only cram in so close to each other. So this is like the same kind of shape that the electrons take when you try to cram six pairs of electrons all around the same central atom. So um, when we have a molecule like boron trifluoride, BF3, all of those groups, the three groups that were around the boron were all the same atom, F, F, and F. So that gives us, that means that all of those electrons were pushing on each other equally. So that gives us um, bond angles of 120 between all of those atoms. But that they're not always, the angles are not always exactly 120. If, for example, we have a situation like this where two of the bonds are single bonds, CH single bonds, and one of the bonds is a carbon-oxygen double bond. So here I have two bonds that are the same and one bond that's different. So what that means is that the electrons in this bond right here 
are pushing on the electrons in this bond and this bond to a different extent. So these, these single bonds feel um, some force between them, some repulsive force, and it's a different force than they feel between this bond and this bond because these bonds are different. So what that does is it makes the uh, angles slightly different here. And we can see this angle is slightly bigger than 120, and this angle down here is smaller than 120. So what we can tell from that then is that if this angle were perfect, then it would be 120. The fact that it's a little bit bigger than 120 means that this group, the double bond, must be pushing, must have a greater repulsive force, and it's pushing it down. The single bond and the double bond are, repulse, are, are repelled greater than the single bond and the single bond because these are being squeezed together. This is less than 120 degrees, but this is greater than 120. So the double bond is pushing on the single bonds harder. It's taking up more space. So um, when I have electrons that are between two atoms, those electrons kind of spread out and we get um, this bonding electron pair and it, the electrons, remember they're not, uh, it's hard to say exactly where the electrons are because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the electrons are somewhere within this region and the region is kind of gets stretched out between the two nuclei. But if there is a lone pair of electrons on an atom, so here is, is uh, a, an example of a molecule where we can see that the bonding, the bonding electron pair here between the O and the H kind of gets spread out between the O and the H. But when there's a, a pair of electrons that's on a lone pair, then it, it kind of takes up more space. If there's nothing over here. There's no positive charge over here that's pulling those electrons toward it, which is what a nucleus is, right? A nucleus is a positive charge. So if there was another nucleus over here that was pulling those electrons toward it, then those electrons would get kind of spread out, kind of like they are here when they're getting pulled toward the H. But as it is in the lone pair, the lone pair kind of takes up more space than the bonding pair does. So here's an example of, of what uh, an effect, what kind of effect that might have on a molecule. So when I draw the Lewis structure for CH4, I have two, four, six, eight electrons around carbon. And uh, so the carbon is full, it, it is met the octet rule. And it doesn't have any lone pairs, they're all bonds. One, two, three, four bonds, eight electrons. When I draw the Lewis structure for NH3, the uh, nitrogen comes in with a lone pair of electrons, remember? Nitrogen has five valence electrons, whereas carbon only has four. And oxygen comes in with six valence electrons. It comes in with two lone pairs of electrons. So carbon has zero lone pairs. And in fact, all of these are H here in methane, CH4. So that means that all of these bonds are pushing on each other evenly, and all of the angles are exactly 109.5, 109.5, 109.5. They're all the same because it's perfectly symmetric. Over here, because this group is a, a lone pair, and it's a big, uh, bigger group than these bonding pairs, this is not symmetric. I have a group on top that's different than the groups on bottom. So this big lone pair, kind of bulky, it pushes down on these groups. Here, this bond doesn't push as hard, just pushes a little bit. Pushes enough to make 109.5, right? Because this bond is pushing back. It pushes the exact same amount back, 109.5. But here, the lone pair pushes a lot, and the bond just pushes a little. So, that means that the bonds get squeezed together. They go from 109.5 to 107. And when I have two lone pairs, then I have even more squeezing. That squeezes these bonds even closer together. 
So when the lone pair takes up more space than the bonds, the bonds, the angle between the bonds gets smaller because the lone pair is squeezing them together. And here these two lone pairs are squeezing it even closer, 104.5 in water. So in a nitrogen atom, the electrons are would be perfectly tetrahedral, 109.5 degrees between all the electrons. But when I have bonds here, the H's are pulling these electrons toward them, and these electrons in the lone pair are not getting pulled toward a nucleus, so they're exerting more repulsive force toward these bonds, which makes the bond angle a little bit smaller. With water, again, two lone pairs is going to squeeze the angle even more. So when we're um, drawing certain Lewis structures, if I were to draw the Lewis structure for SF4, I would start with the S and put the number of valence electrons that S has, which is 6, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we draw our F atoms, four of them. Remember, S should go in the middle because it's closest to the center of the periodic table. So we put the S in the middle. And fluorine atoms have seven electrons. One single electron and three lone pairs. All right, so now at this point, we start connecting single electrons to make bonds. So we do that one, and we do that one, and now it looks like sulfur is full because sulfur came in with those two lone pairs, so uh, it doesn't have any more single electrons left. So in this case, what we should do is just make a bond between that fluorine and one of these electrons anyway, and make a bond between fluorine and one of these electrons because SF4 implies that there are four fluorines in the molecule and if S goes in the middle then those four fluorines must all be connected to S so they must all be bonded to S so what it's okay to break up those pairs see it looks weird that I bonded to the um, to one electron in the pair it's okay to do that the reason that we start with two single electrons on sulfur and two pairs is because when sulfur is following the octet rule, this is a really good place to start because then it would just make these two bonds, one bond, two bonds, and it would have two, four, six, eight electrons. So we draw the Lewis structure of the atoms with single electrons and double electrons because it shows us how many bonds that atom is typically going to make. Sulfur typically makes one, two bonds because it has two unpaired electrons. Oxygen, which is in the same column as sulfur right above it, oxygen always makes two bonds because it can't have an expanded octet like sulfur can. So oxygen with two singles and two pairs tells us that oxygen is always going to make two single bonds or at least two bonds. It can also make a double bond. So in this case, because I have to attach all these fluorines to sulfur, I'm going to break the octet rule, so I'm gonna, I'm, I can break up these pairs, because I have to do it anyway. So I'll make one bond here to, to that electron and one bond here to that electron. And now I have these two electrons that are kind of half of a pair. So what do I do with those? Well, I'm just going to move them. I'm going to erase that one from there. I'm going to erase that one from there. And I'm just going to draw them back right next to each other as a pair. So I broke up a pair and actually turned it into two single electrons. And then I just took the other two and made them back into a pair. 
So I'm going to kind of put a little circle. Oops, I want to put a circle around it so that we know that it's a it's a pair because I didn't make it very apparent that that was a pair. There we go. So now it's a, a pair of electrons there. So this is the Lewis structure for SF4. So now when I draw a Lewis structure, I don't get I don't have any idea of what the shape looks like really because this just looks flat. I see that I have four bonds, I have a, a lone pair. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, what that means is that I have one, two, three, four, five areas, five electron groups, and five electron groups are going to try to spread out as far as possible. And when I have five groups, what shape is that? It's trigonal bipyramidal, right? So if this were a bond right here, you could see that, right? It has one, two, three, four, five groups, and it's kind of that trigonal bipyramidal shape. So when I make my Lewis structure, the last step in making a Lewis structure is counting the electron groups. One, two, three, four, five electron groups. And now that I know how many electron groups the molecule has, I look at my chart and say, oh, five electron groups is trigonal bipyramidal. So now I know the geometry of that molecule. I know the shape. If I, if I can draw this picture, then I can say, OK, I, now I know the bond angles. These Fs are actually 120 degrees apart right here, or maybe a little bit less than 120 degrees apart, because this is a lone pair, and the lone pair pushes kind of hard, harder on the bond than a bond would. So the, the lone pair is going to squeeze these bonds together. OK, so the last decision we have to make, this is a, a complex process. You can see drawing a molecule is a, co a really complex process. We start with this, where we just have the formula. And then we have to turn it into this, where it's just kind of like a flat ball and stick representation. And then we can, using this information, we can kind of start to picture this where we're now thinking, OK, those five groups are going to spread out as far as they can. So that's going to give me this trigonal bipyramidal shape. And now the last thing that we have to think about in a molecule like SF4 is where does the lone pair go? Because a molecule that's trigonal bipyramidal has two different kinds of spaces. These spaces right here are called equatorial, as if we imagine that this is like the Earth, then these, F, these Fs uh, right here would be around the equator, and this lone pair would be around the equator, like these Fs, around the equator, equatorial. And these Fs right here that are 180 degrees apart, these are axial. They're on the axis, the axes of the Earth. So do I put the lone pair in an axial position? where it's 180 degrees away from an F? Or do I put the lone pair in an equatorial position where it's 120 degrees away from an F? Right? Those are, that's a different, it would make two different molecules depending on where I put that lone pair. It's going to yield two completely different shapes, which would be two completely different molecules. So it's important to figure out where it's supposed to go. So we know that a lone pair is, is big. It's big and bulky. It's bigger than a bond, right? That's why we draw this big balloon to show the lone pair is really big. So a big lone pair needs as much space as it can possibly get. A big lone pair wants to be in the position that's going to keep it as far away from the other groups as possible. So then the question we have to answer is, does a lone pair have more space when it's in an axial position, or does a lone pair have more space when it's in an equatorial position? Well, here in the axial position, it's 90 degrees away from this one, it's 90 degrees away from this one, and it's 90 degrees away from this one. Those 90 degree bond angles are very small. So let's look at this one over here. Now it's uh, 90 degrees away from this one, and 90 degrees away from this one, and 120 degrees away from these. So we, we're trying, when we're trying to place the lone pair, 
what we're trying to do is minimize the number of 90 degree angles. Here I have one, two, three 90 degree angles that are 90 degrees away from the lone pair. Here I have one, two 90 degree angles that are 90 degrees away from the lone pair. That means that the lone pair is happier in this position. It has more space. It feels less repulsive force from these groups in this position when it's equatorial. So when I have five bonds on a molecule like this, it's called trigonal bipyramidal. But when I have four bonds and a lone pair, it's called seesaw. Because you can, the lone pair is kind of invisible, right? There's no atom here. So over here, the lone pair disappears because it, if there's no atom, we can't see it. But remember, it's still there. It's just kind of invisible. So if the, it's still there and it's still giving us this kind of trigonal bipyramidal shape, then uh, without that last group, this is a seesaw. And you can imagine that if you take this and kind of lay this F down on this side, then it kind of sits like a, a teeter-totter, a seesaw, where one group is up in the air and the other group kind of sits on the table and they can go back and forth along this fulcrum right here. So if you have a molecular model kit, um, they are very helpful for this chapter and we're gonna, we'll use them here in this chapter and a little bit in the next chapter and a little bit uh, either at the end of this term or the beginning of next term in 223. So those model kits are really helpful for this, for this material specifically. Because if you make a shape that's trigonal, oops, if you make a shape that's trigonal bipyramidal out of, with your model, and it has five groups, and they have this orientation, and they have these bond angles. And then all you have to do is pluck one of them out. So you would make this trigonal bipyramidal model with your, with your kit, and then you, you grab this CL atom and pull it out. And what you've done is make this, seesaw. And from the seesaw geometry, all you have to do is plug that CL right back in, and then you've made trigonal bipyramidal. So similarly, here we've got tetrahedral, and if you make this model where you plug four groups in and, it, and they have a 109.5 degree angle, then you've got a tetrahedral group, and then you just grab the H and pluck it out. And then you've made this one, and this is called trigonal pyramidal. It's not trigonal planar anymore because it's not flat. It has three groups, so it's still tri, but it looks like a pyramid because I plucked this top one out. So this is a tetrahedral group, but if I pluck one out, now it's trigonal pyramidal. Because remember that group, when I pluck it out, the reason that the shape doesn't really change is because those electrons are still there, and they're still pushing on these groups. When I pluck another one out, those electrons didn't really go anywhere. They're still there. They're just in a, a lone pair now. Right? So you can imagine that there is still like a bond here and there's still a bond here. That's why these shapes are very similar. They're, they all have tetrahedral electron geometry, but this one has a tetrahedral molecular geometry because the molecule is shaped tetrahedral. This one is trigonal pyramidal because one of the atoms is gone. Now it's a lone pair. And this one is called bent because two of the atoms are gone, and now those lone pairs are kind of pushing this group together a little bit. So here is another uh, example where we take, we'll, t we'll take the um, trigonal bipyramidal shape, this one, you would take your model and make this trigonal bipyramidal shape here. And then if we pluck two of the groups out, then we could make a shape like this. 
So again, if we were to draw, if I tell you to draw B, R, F, 3, then we would just start this the same way. B, R, we imagine that BR is going to go in the middle because I have one of them and I have three of these F's. And we fill in the valence electrons from the periodic table and BR has seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they're all in the same column, so they all have the same number of valence electrons. And then we start making single bonds. Single bond, remember like we did in the last one, it's okay to break up these pairs. So break up that pair, break up that pair. Now, since I broke up those pairs, I'm going to rejoin them as those leftovers are going to make a new pair. I'll put that new pair right here. Okay, so then this is what we get. So I've made three bonds, and now bromine has two lone pairs. So again, we have one, two, three, four, five electron groups. So if I have five electron groups, then those electrons are going to look like this. Those electrons are going to, to take this shape. If there are five electron groups around a central atom, they're going to take this shape, trigonal bipyramidal. But now, although I have five electron groups around that atom, I only have three atoms. There's only three bonds to new atoms. The two of those five electron groups are lone pairs. So you can imagine that if there was a bond here, F, and if there was a bond here, F, then this would just look like trigonal bipyramidal. But again, I plucked these two groups away. So that, that F is gone, and this F is gone, and where they were is now just a lone pair of electrons. So now we're left with the same question that we had in the last one. Where do the lone pairs of electrons go? Do they go in equatorial positions, or do they go in axial positions? Well, we just discovered on the last slide that those lone pairs prefer equatorial positions. So if I have one lone pair, it's going to go in an equatorial position. And if I have two lone pairs, they're both going to go in equatorial positions. So lone pairs prefer equatorial positions. So what that means is that if I am going to pluck off two of these uh, groups in the equatorial position and replace them with lone pairs, now I can't say that this molecule is trigonal bipyramidal anymore, because if I had these groups here, then sure, trigonal bipyramidal. But now that they're not there anymore, and remember the lone pairs kind of look invisible, now it's not trigonal bipyramidal, now it looks like a T. T-shaped, kind of a sideways T, and I have to knock it over. So um, when I have a molecule like BRF3 that has two lone pairs, it has five electron groups, but two of the electron groups are lone pairs, then they're going to be in the equatorial position because that's the position that gives them the most room to spread out. And then the shape that's going to give us is called T-shaped. So just write P-H-E-T into Google. Mine's being difficult, trying to send me to the website. I guess it's being helpful. So you type P-H-E-T into the web, into Google, and the first thing that should come up is this website, um, Free Online Physics, Chemistry, Biology. So um, this website, I usually use the chemistry ones, but some of the physics ones are helpful for our class and for your other classes. I'm sure there's some helpful stuff in here too. These um, simulations, um, they kind of bring chemistry to life a little bit because you can hear me talk about it and we can look at these pictures, but that doesn't uh, really 
do it do some of these ideas justice because sometimes when we're talking about some of these complex ideas that involve motion it's really hard to um, uh, to picture moving moving systems in your head they're pretty complicated so here's a bunch of different um, simulations and animations we're gonna do this one right now molecular shapes so here's what it does I have this molecule I can try these you can see that I'm trying to move this bond closer to the other one and what's happening is it's pushing the other one away because these bonds are repelling each other because they're made of negative electrons so I try to push it away I try to get it closer and I can't get them any closer because the electrons are, are repelling so if I add another bond right now they're 180 degrees apart right so this is a linear molecule if I add another bond now they uh, try to get as far apart as they can and as far apart as they can is 300 and or excuse me 120 degrees if I add another bond now they're 109.5 degrees they're, try they're trying to get as far away as possible look how far apart they're spreading I can add another bond now this is as far apart as they can get here's that trigonal bipyramidal shape trigonal bipyramidal add another bond now it's octahedral and six is the most I can add so what if I am gonna remove all add some bonds here two three <coughs> excuse me and now I'm gonna add a lone pair so if this was a bond can I remove this there we go so let's yeah let's do that if I have a, a lone pair here with three bonds then look that lone pair kind of pushes down on those three bonds but if I take the lone pair away now those three bonds are flat this is trigonal planar but I put the lone pair on the lone pair pushes down on them in fact the lone pair pushes down on them the same amount that a bond would I put the bond on there look the bond does the same thing that the lone pair does because the lone pair is electrons it pushes down on those three the bond pushes down on those three so if I start here with this one trigonal bipyramidal and I remove one of the bonds and I add a lone pair it's gonna give me seesaw so here's the seesaw right because it kind of one side I don't know if I can move it the right way one side will go up and one side will go down there we go up and down like a seesaw all right so if I remove two bonds oops and add a lone pair now I have two lone pairs they're both in equatorial positions because that gives them the most space and now I made a t-shaped molecule what if I remove three bonds and add another lone pair now I, I have five electron groups but the molecule is linear again because those there's no atoms out here another t-shaped molecule when I have an octahedral when I have three lone pairs and three bonds here's two lone pairs and four bonds this is called square planar or can I, I can have five bonds and one lone pair and look you can come down here and it tells you what they're called so this is a very helpful uh, simulation when you're working through the homework this will help you with these the names the shapes the names of the shapes of these molecules you can build the model build a molecule here and then see what the shape is called and see what effect the lone pair has on the molecule how it repels the other bonds I remove the lone pair and then those bond those bonds come forward to occupy the space where the lone pair was they want to spread out I remove another bond they spread out even more I remove another bond they spread out even more here is that linear shape remove three lone pairs or excuse me three atoms and give three lone pairs in the equatorial positions 
like Xe F2, two bonds, three lone pairs, then I would get a, a geometry that would look like this. You can see electron geometry, trigonal bipyramidal, that's referring to the shape with five electron groups. That's the electron geometry. And the molecular geometry, we're referring to the actual shape of the molecule here. What's the shape of this molecule? Because the lone pairs are invisible. So if the lone pairs are invisible, then this looks like a line. It's linear. So again, if you go to this simulation, it will tell us the same thing. Trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry, linear molecular geometry. Octahedral electron geometry, square pyramidal molecular geometry. So we have six groups all together, one, two, three, four, five, six, but only five of them are atoms. Five of them are bonds. So let's put five bonds. Five bonds, one lone pair. Octahedral electron geometry, square pyramidal molecular geometry. And here's another one, square planar. So play around with that simulation while you're answering the questions on the homework. It, it's really helpful to help learn these shapes. And here is the table I promised. So when you're drawing your Lewis structures, what we're trying to do at this point is convert our Lewis structures that look like this. We want to start thinking about them looking like this. Because when I draw it like this, it's misleading. It looks like these like these bonds are 90 degree angles but in fact these bonds are 109.5 degree angles so this is the point of this section is to draw our Lewis structures and now start thinking about their shapes and this chart helps us to do that count the number of bonds so carbon dioxide has two bonds and zero lone pairs two bonds zero lone pairs linear BF3 has one, two, three bonds around the central atom. There's no lone pairs around the central atom. Three bonds, zero lone pairs, trigonal planar. What if I have two bonds and one lone pair around the central atom? Two bonds and one lone pair around the central atom is called trigonal planar electron geometry bent molecular geometry because look now I pulled this group off I pulled it off of there it's not trigonal planar anymore now it's called bent and here are the other entries from that table all the ones that we were just looking at you should have this table pulled up when you're working through the homework and even when you're um, on the test. You can have this table pulled up when you're working through the test. I would recommend it because this is a lot of information to memorize. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter. All right, so again, let's review. To do this, we draw the Lewis structure first. We determine the number of electron groups from our Lewis structure only around the central atom. So I would uh, emphasize only around the central atom. Sometimes students count the bonds and lone pairs around every atom in the molecule and that's too many bonds and lone pairs. You won't find an entry on the table. You only count the electron groups around the central atom. Uh, classify each electron group as a bonding group or a lone pair and then count the number of groups. And once we have the number of groups, you use table, that table to determine the shape and the bond angles. So you might see these images uh, when you're working through the homework and in the textbook. A straight line means that that bond is in the, uh, oops. A straight line means that a bond is in the plane of the paper, it's flat. A wedge means that the bond is coming out of the paper, like it's, it's pro so this would be like coming out toward you, out of your computer screen and this dash is going back behind your computer screen. So these symbols are to show us three-dimensional 
molecules coming out, going back.